Welcome to the show, Dr. Margaret. Thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? What is going well? Well, I'm doing very fine. Thank you so much for being on your show. It's really exciting to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, why don't you just give us an introduction? Who are you and what is it that you do? My name is Dr. Margit Gabriel Muller. I'm a certified mental health coach. I'm also a master life coach and master NLP practitioner. And I'm also accredited with the International Coaching Federation as a professional certified coach. But I'm also a veterinarian and uh, award-winning author. So it's quite a combination, but now I'm really focusing on the mental health coaching. Wonderful. So a lot of coaching going, going through your experience and your education. That's, that's amazing. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, what What's a mental health coach? I mean, just just by hearing it, it sounds it sounds awesome. It sounds like exactly what we need in the world right now. But can you explain a little bit more about what what that that means? Yeah, it's a very new field, uh, a new new part in the field of life coaching. And it is much more advanced than the normal life coaching. In normal life coaching, it's like a question and answer. You try to help your client. But in mental health coaching, we go much, much deeper, actually. Um, it is a kind of help for people who have mental health concerns. And as you correctly said, nowadays it is so much needed and so much required. And a mental health coach has a specific training to really go deep in those mental health concerns. Um, I'm doing inner dynamics. I, I, we can explain it later on. But it means that it is not just try to help people to live a better life, but also to let them, for example, access some kind of childhood trauma to try to process it, to heal it, because that's one of the root causes of mental health concern. But the borderline is that as a mental health coach, we are taking care of clients with mental health concerns that are not mental illness and that are not diagnosed as a mental illness. This is for psychiatrists or counselors. So that's where we draw the line. Interesting. What's, what's a typical client look like for you? Well, for me, actually, my typical client is, yeah, you can say a businesswoman from the age between 30 to 60. And usually these are ladies who have experienced massive childhood trauma because one of their parents or both of them were suffering from a mental illness like bipolar disorder or multiple personality disorder or schizophrenia. So they have been so much traumatized in their childhood, but they never had the opportunity to process this trauma. So this trauma actually keeps them stuck in the past in these old patterns they are not able to make peace with their past and it's difficult for them to move forward. So this trauma is really even affecting their current relationships. It's making problems with their work because they have never been able to overcome it, which affects their self-esteem, their self-trust, their self-confidence, and this has a negative impact on their work. So that's my typical client. So I try to help them to access this uh, childhood trauma to start to relieve this pain and hurt that has happened in this time and to start to let them understand that, yeah, they need to make peace with their past because otherwise they cannot move forward. And the change is, is amazing, actually. Well, that's amazing. How how does my father who has this is this is just hypothetical. My father's got schizophrenia disorder. And um, how does that affect me as a child? And then that leads into my like adulthood. Like, obviously, as, as young children, we have certain kind of safety defense mechanisms that come up for us. You know, we're kids; our brains aren't you know, fully developed yet, and um, we're you know figuring ourselves out in the world. So our our brain will certainly create certain uh, defensive pathways to you know keep us from I don't know significant harm. But obviously, if that is not um, if we don't go back to that and work through it, like through therapy or through coaching or, or something, then that stagnates and that stays with us and can become part of our adulthood and our personality. And then potentially we, we pass that through again to like our children and it keeps going through these generations. So like, how can you kind of explain to us a little bit how my, me as a kid and how my father's illness uh, would affect me as a young person? 
Yes, that's actually that's exactly my story because it was my mother who suffered from schizophrenia, actually. <laughs> but I had to work through all this process on my own because there was no mental health coach who could help me. But the point is, and this is where the specific area of mental health coaching comes in, which is called inner dynamics. We call it part psychology. So it's directly bordering to psychotherapy. So the point is that when you are a child and you have experienced your, your father having some kind of yeah, schizophrenic episodes, you have been deeply traumatized because your father talks to people that don't exist. Uh, he has delusions. He has hallucinations. But as a child, you are not able to understand what's going on. So you understand it more or less in a wrong way. You think it's your fault what's happening. You uh, feel this, yeah, that you are the root cause for all of this, what is happening. Most of the children do that. And because you are so deeply hurt and so deeply in pain and these experiences are hugely traumatizing you keep those experiences in your subconscious mind so more or less what you do you bury those experiences in your subconscious mind and sometimes you cannot even remember them consciously so this is where for example me now as a mental health coach comes in with inner dynamics in inner dynamics we look at a person as somebody who has different parts so these parts they coexist and for example you know like in daily life you sometimes say ah oh, you know i would like to go to the cinema and it, the other part of me says oh it's so nice to be a couch potato and just to watch a movie and tv so these are parts that are talking we say it unconsciously but these are parts inside ourselves different parts of our personality that are conflicting now when we have this childhood trauma we have parts that have been so much hurt, that have become so vulnerable, that they stuck in the past. These parts are not developing. They stay in this childhood age. And other parts move in to try to protect you. So they try to protect you, to help you to cope with all those experiences. And more or less, they try to yeah, cover up those vulnerable parts. So what happens? that you cannot access those vulnerable parts anymore that have those horrible memories, that have those traumatic experiences and that are so deeply hurt and that carry a huge burden. So those protecting parts, they try to help you, to protect you that it doesn't happen again, that you will not be hurt again to such an extent. So this is where I come in because I am the, you can say the facilitation that we start talking to those parts and try to yeah, to unblend, to remove those protector parts that we can access those parts that have been so much hurt. And once we start accessing them, then we can go back to this memory in the childhood. And this even works if, you, for example, you were three or four or five years old only, and now you're, let's say, 40 or 50. Still, we can go back and we can really go through this memory together again and try to heal this burden and to let this part understand that, you're in a different situation now, you have grown up, you live a different life now. So we try to heal this pain, the burden and the hurt and to bring it now into the present. So it's a kind of process, but it is hugely powerful. It's a very, very, very powerful tool if you know how to do it. That's why, for example, me, I have been specially trained on this one. And the point is, once you let, you, you, you are able to heal those parts and to bring them into the present, you really create a, a life-changing experience for the client because all this pain and hurt gets relieved. And they start to understand that it's not their fault what has happened. It was just the father was unlucky, actually, that he got sick. So they create, it's a kind of new stronger personality they become more resilient they become stronger they start to understand what has happened and they're able to process it rationally and emotionally so it opens them a new way to deal with other people because it is enhancing their self-esteem their self-confidence it removes this stigma of mental illness which is there still until today we have the stigma of mental illness in society and it lets them understand mm. that it is not their fault and I think this is essential for them to move on so they can start living their authentic lives without having the burden of their past and to make peace with their past. And this is essential to move forward. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting that obviously, you know, you're quite young kids. I have a one and a three-year-old and I've got experience with, you know, five-year-olds -year five and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. And it's quite interesting in regards to how they see the world. Um, you know, they're very, you know, they, they, it's just, it, other than there may be parents and some friends, they don't have the whole experience of there being, you know, seven billion people on the planet and the planet being huge. So, you know, technically, like for them, the world especially for my three-year-old son, the world evol mm -hmm. revolves around them, right? So they're kind of like very, yeah. very, very internal. It's all about mm -hmm. them. And it's a very important part of development, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But it would make total sense that if something unexplainable was happening, mm -hmm. say, to their father and there were certain outbursts or certain behaviors that didn't quite make sense to a three, five-year-old, whatever, um, it would make sense that you would internalize that as your own fault because the whole world evolves around you, right? As, as that age, it's very, very interesting. You just, you just kind of made me connect those dots, but I, I just question in regards to you were talking about that, the inner dynamics and those subconscious, um, those subconscious, um, the subconscious brain and where we put those things when we're quite young and we can't really digest or explain these things. How do you begin to access that? Like 20 years later, <laughs> it is a process. I, I'm not saying it's an easy one. It's hard work, but you start accessing it by letting the client start to get in contact with his parts. So we are not usually consciously dealing with our parts. Yes, we, we say, yeah, one part wants this, one part wants that, but it is not something that we do consciously. So the first step is to create this conscious connection with the parts and then to identify which parts exist because everybody has different parts. You can have a lot of different parts. You can have 20, 30, 40 different parts and each one has a different purpose to protect you or to support you. There are no bad parts. Huh? They are all good. They all have a good intention. Sometimes the intention goes wrong, but they, they, they try to support you, but they do it maybe not in the right way. But this is the first step. Then you try, once you start to create this connection with the parts, then you try to, yeah, remove a bit these protector parts, which means you try, we call it unblending. You, you push them a little bit away to give you space to be able to start connecting with those vulnerable parts, which are deep, deep down, and they are really, really hidden. And once you're able to do that and you work with them, then in the end, you start connecting with all your parts. And then once you connect with all your parts and you start to move everything a bit out, then you are able to connect with your inner self. And that's the ultimate goal. The inner self is your, yeah, your core being, the real you. The real you without any single layer. So this is really you. So we try to connect you with this one as the ultimate goal, plus to heal all those burdens that you carry. And it is a process. For some people, it goes faster. For others, it takes more time. But it is hugely liberating. Once you are able, first of all, to access those parts, it's, it's amazing to see the clients, how they start understanding, ah, oh, this is why I'm doing this in this way, because it is this part that's telling me. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes even you have anger or resentment, it is a part that it tells you to do that. So uh in the end yes we try to go to this inner self and it it is it is fascinating because this is the place where you really feel at peace where you feel serenity calmness and where you are really you and this is where we want to go so um it's a fascinating process even me as a mental health coach i never know how we go because it just develops there is no roadmap you take it part by part one at a time and it's a fascinating process and it really changes the life of the clients because it's the first time they do this usually. And the impact it has is hugely, hugely powerful because they start to understand what has happened in their childhood. They can process it. They can start to heal it. And sometimes, you know, they even say, now I can feel this burden lifting from my heart. So even the language says that the burden starts to lift and these are those parts that we are yeah healing that we are bringing in the present so it, it's fascinating yeah. actually yeah it sounds like it would be quite unusual for an adult unless they were working with a coach or going through something very serious for them to actually like go through the process of like you know going back and working through a particular trauma because 
you know, if something did happen to us that we were actually conscious of, like when we we're like yeah. five years old, say a parent passing away or something, and then another parent being really depressed, we would be aware of that situation going on. I'm sure our mind would um, fill in kind of the blanks as we were quite young. But we would certainly, as adults, we would probably wouldn't really revisit that with like a, a fresh new mind that you would have as an adult. You know, your brain, your brain would literally be completely new at that point. So being able to go back with the support of with the support of a practitioner to go back to that that time and actually look at it with kind of fr look at that whole th situation with fresh eyes mm -hmm. certainly sounds like it would be very eye-opening and impactful and once you recognize that yeah the brain fills in so many of these details for us that might not necessarily be true and when we're young i said it before like you know we are quite selfish individuals and we believe the world is you know the world is ours um <laughs> so yeah going back going back with fresh eyes as an adult and having a little bit more maybe let's just say adult perspective on that situation and recognizing that you know especially if a parent is going through something very very serious be that pathological or not then it's not our fault and there's certainly like a significant um amount of being able to like let go of of all of the emotions and thoughts and behaviors kind of wrapped up in all of that and i'm sure it like it, it liberates a whole lot of people um are there, are there typical adult behaviors that we see um in those individuals that do have like evidence of like that clear trauma are there things that we do as adults that would like you know like kind of like like red flags or like do you know what i mean yes i know exactly okay. what you mean okay. before I, I answer this i just want to come back to what you just said now um it's absolutely true. It is not easy to revisit it. And I would certainly not recommend it to do it on your own. You need a qualified help, a qualified uh, therapist or coach who can guide you through this process and who knows exactly where you are in this process to help you through the process. So I would never do it alone on myself. I wouldn't recommend this because you cannot really understand this process on your own and you need a, a helping hand for this. So I think that is essential to say. Now, what you said about the red flags, totally right. There are several red flags. Some of them are, for example, that you feel this guilt that it was your fault and this guilt really doesn't leave you. Sometimes even you have this resentment or anger or rage. Why this happened to me? Why my parent did this to me? So even this resentment and rage can stay and it is impacting the relationships with other people because you are not able to see relationships in a correct way because you are tainted by the memory and you take things from a wrong perspective. Often uh, adult children of mentally ill parents have problems with their self-confidence, their self-esteem. Sometimes they have imposter syndrome, for example, at work, because they, deep down they think they made something wrong and they don't deserve it to be happy they don't deserve it to be successful it cannot be because of those experiences so that's another point and a lot of them are simply not able to forgive their parent and some of them simply they don't want to have anything to do with the parent they want to cut off the contact completely because they think that's the solution um they are not able to build relationships that are built on trust. Uh, and that's so important because they never had this trusting relationship with the parent. And even often they have problems to do a good parenting themselves with their own children because they didn't have the role model of the parent. When the parent got sick, it doesn't matter if it was the father or the mother, the parent was not able anymore to take the role as a parent on so the child had to become you can say the parent of his parent <laughs> like this because the parent wasn't able to fulfill this role anymore so because this role model has changed and the child has grown up with this they are not learning how correct parenting has to be done and it is very often affecting the relationship with their own children so there are different things um, personal and then even with relationships that are so deeply impacted by those traumatic experiences and that are really red flags and they are not conscious. I mean, these are things that are so deeply ingrained in, in the clients actually that they are not even aware of those patterns they are following because they cannot connect the dots between their current behavior or the way how they 
parents their children often in a wrong way or how they deal with their partner their spouse or even their work colleague and they cannot connect those dots with the childhood trauma and that's where i come in as a mental health coach first of all to connect those dots and to work on it to yeah clear it up honestly like when you say like guilt self-confidence issues um parental issues trust issues with relationships mm -hmm. i think that's like 60 percent of the population of the planet <laughs> and and that and that you know honestly that makes sense because like you know i don't think anyone comes out of childhood unscathed you know in regards to like physical or psychological i don't want to say abuse but like you know we all experience trauma in different ways and mm -hmm. um i don't think i mean it, we, even when parents do their very very best you know they're they're you know, nobody parents perfectly let's just put it that way mm -hmm. you know and it's also like yeah. an interesting um learning experience to be parented and then you kind of like want to come out of that and can you successfully build relationships can you be kind of guilt-free do you have confidence yes. and yeah like just when you're saying those flags you know i i can i know a bunch of people that fall into that category but they would never ever think that they would have a mental issue mental health issue mm -hmm. in regards to that past trauma and mm -hmm. certainly wouldn't think to hiring somebody to rectify that even though they certainly would benefit from it because yeah like holding on to like those i'm going to call them like negative emotions like that yeah. guilt and that that, that lack of self-confidence and those um the distrust those particular emotions or behaviors they hold a very specific energetic frequency that um doesn't doesn't serve us as, as 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 human beings to like you know to advance ourselves forward and to evolve and to do great things and to certainly you know build relationships and be able to um rebuild them after you know like you know a, a parent does go through something like that and then you're an adult and you're just like annoyed and angry with your parents for like 10 20 years and then you might have kids and then you might realize oh my gosh like having kids is like the hardest thing ever on the planet and like you start having empathy you start having forgiveness you start having compassion and gratitude for your parents and hopefully that that, that experience of being a parent yourself and you know having to you know, pay the bills and to get have have a job and work hard and experience how life is super super difficult and you're able to like start thinking back to your childhood and having a little bit more empathy and compassion for your parents and i feel like that's yeah. a really big that must be a big part of the process because once you can start digesting those traumatic um relationships or traumatic situations that you had in your childhood when you're an adult you can start translating them with those like elevated emotions of joy happiness love gratitude yes. you know that carry such a beautiful one wonderful energetic frequency then people are able to start like maybe forgiving themselves and forgiving other people and then start having different neurological pathways within their thoughts within their emotions with their behaviors and yeah it's just it's just interesting you listed those red flags and it's like so many people ha have that and i think so many people could benefit from even even if they're on this like the low end of the scale of having like a mental health issue rather than having someone like really traumatic at the other side could seriously benefit from like working with somebody like you just to you know start creating some forgiveness yes exactly and that's the point because so many people are not aware of why they're having as you said these yeah negative emotions and why it is affecting them because as you said they cannot connect the dots and it doesn't have to be such a tremendous traumatic experience like with a parent uh, who has a mental illness i mean that's that's massive i mean this is devastating for a child to 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 say it. <laughs> it's an ordeal not everybody has those massive experiences but as a child even so called smaller negative experiences can have a traumatic impact and this can have a lasting traumatic impact and that's why i believe that the main issue is that people need to be able to say first of all yes i have an issue and i need help and it is okay to ask for help because still until today when we talk about any kind of mental health concern i'm not talking even about mental health Ill, uh, mental illness even mental health concerns are still stigmatized in our society if you have a broken leg you go to a hospital you get a nice surgery your leg will heal and everything is fine but if you have those kind 
it is not accepted by society because we have to function perfectly in our mind. And it, it doesn't have, it, it, it is not, I mean, one in five people in the whole world is suffering from a mental illness. I mean, these are huge figures and these are real illnesses. I'm not talking about mental health concerns. I talk about the real illnesses. So the number is huge, but until now it is not accepted in society. And if this starts to change, then everybody, as you said, who has those red flags, even if there were smaller traumas in their childhood, they would be able to ask for help like mental health coaches who are specialized in this because they get a new quality uh, of living actually once they are able to work through this because it is changing the way how they see themselves. They get a different perspective of what has happened and the relationship with other people changes completely. And I mean, in the end, all of us, we deserve a happy, healthy life <laughs> without having all these constraints, without having all these negative emotions. And I think it is really time that this is changing. And that's why I believe for a lot of people, the concept of mental health coaching is something pretty weird because they don't know about it yet. Uh, but I think it has to change because this is so helpful. If you can go for somebody who can help you and who is specialized in doing this, it is really changing your life. And uh, to go back to this childhood trauma, it's not an easy path. But once you do it and you are able to access it and process it and understand that no matter what has happened, either with a parent with mental illness or any other kind of incident that was so massive in your childhood, once you are able to understand it and look at it from a different perspective, then things will change because you are able to forgive. You are able to change the patterns in which you live. You are able to, to move forward from those past experiences. And that's the only way how things are working out, actually. Yeah, I mean, I see a very interesting pattern in regards to the the, the rise of um, or the need for different types of therapists, be that um, mental health coaches or psychotherapists mm -hmm. or, you know, or psychiatrists. Like, I think it's so important that we do have these individuals out there because we just people are craving them these days because yeah. just when it comes to relationships like we're talking about having like trust issues and relationships and, and mm -hmm. connections with people especially like in larger countries and when the western world we have this very very we have this huge disconnect it's kind of everything like to yeah. the natural world to our families to um our friends or or just people we don't know who are actually part of our community but we like you know we we isolate them and we create disconnect and we kind of do it quite deliberately and um, so it makes total sense that we we would have more people requiring you know whether that be extreme therapy or like kind of like low level therapy and it's at the end of the day it's communication it's talking it's like expressing yourself and getting these things yes. literally off your chest and speaking with somebody who is maybe not like your partner or a family member mm -hmm. or you know like um somebody who you can you know who can l l look at it with like with no judgment or like knowing yeah. you too well you know it can sometimes just be completely so much easier to talk to a complete stranger and it makes total sense to me that you know, this we see we clearly see this rise in mental issue mental health issues and we see this rise of therapists that need to get out there and support these individuals and it just goes to show that um these kind of like larger larger cities or larger countries that we have and this this disconnect we have with individuals it just goes like just even chatting to your neighbor and getting connected with other people you can start yeah. to have understanding and empathy for other people because everyone's kind of like everyone's going through tough times everyone's got their own stuff and you know and everyone's just probably most people are just trying to do their best and yeah it's interesting the whole that whole that the word mental i don't know it just it's, a, it's an interesting word. I think that when we can't, you know, you said bro like a broken leg, like I can, see, I can kind of see the damage of a broken leg with my, with my eyes, but I can't, yeah. I can't see depression. I can't see anxiety. I can't see schizophrenia like inside my head. I can't see the actual matter in my m mind, like being damaged and causing those things. So we have a big misunderstanding of the things that we can't, experience with our senses i feel like i've mentioned this in every podcast episode the fact that 
we're quite we're very we have very limited senses and we try to explain everything in regards to that and then when we can't actually see it feel it taste it or touch it then it becomes a little bit more like mysterious so when it comes to like mental health or i might have depression i might have anxiety it's so much more difficult for us to internalize that or even express that outwards because we can't we, we can't see it and it's it's just yeah it's it's like it's it's almost like it's mysterious and we obviously don't the the science of the brain is evolving all of the time i don't think we really know anything about the brain in regards to its capacity like we're maybe one percent of like <laughs> considering so we're learning all the time of kind of like how it works but at the end of the day we know what's good for the mind and communication and um connecting with other people and trying to hold yourself with compassion, love and joy is certainly going to benefit a lot of people. Yes, I totally agree with you. And I think also one of the problems is whenever we talk about anything related to the mind or mental, mental health, mental illness, mental uh, disorders, uh, it is always, yes, we cannot really fully understand it or most of the people can't. And in the same time, the stigma is still strong. I mean, when we think about, when we talk about people who have mental problems, immediately people will think those people are crazy. They will be outcast. Um, they are abnormal and they might be dangerous. And this is what is still in the mind of people. And this is something that is centuries old. I mean, when we go back, even in the medieval times, yeah, people were crazy. <laughs> then uh, they burn the witches but it, <laughs> that's exactly the point that this is still so deeply ingrained in people's minds that's the idea what they have and this is still the stigma that exists out there and i think podcasts like your podcasts are essential to start changing these patterns changing the awareness and creating an understanding that as you said when you have a broken leg you have a right to see a doctor if you have, let's say, a broken mind or an issue with your mind, you also have a right to see your doctor. And it should be accepted by society. And it doesn't mean you are crazy. It doesn't mean you, you are abnormal. It simply means you need help. And this is where things have to move forward. And podcasts like yours are a great step in moving things forward to create this awareness. Because as you said, so many more people are suffering nowadays from mental health issues. And when we go back in the old days, you had big families with aunties, uncles, grandpa, grandfather, and everybody lived together. So you had a kind of social network, a protective family network. Nowadays, people are living alone in big cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they never see even their neighbors. They have this social isolation. They have this loneliness. And that's one of the big contributing factor, factors also to have those mental health uh, issues. So these things have to change and that's also one point yes where we come in as mental health coaches to help and to support and to try to create a change yeah i don't think we can really change or begin to heal any type of trauma unless we ask for help and it usually takes getting to a point of like like something serious happens in your life maybe the death of a loved one or you do get diagnosed with something serious you know before we actually start thinking that i do need to make a big like change in my life because i don't know why it's a very very interesting um conversation but like why most people have a huge problem with asking for help or support um as you were talking there like it wasn't so long ago where we would have three four generations of, of a family living together helping and supporting each other like organically and now like we're so far away from that it's disturbing that um asking for help is like a sign of weakness and like trying to maybe like rest your mind or your body is a sign of weakness because we're supposed to be busy we're supposed to be like stressed we're supposed to be yeah like it's why whenever whenever i go back to england and I speak to some friends that like work in London, like it's almost like who can be the most stressed is like the most successful. And I'm like, dude, when you hit 50 and you have a, when you have to go to the doctor and you've got like something seriously, you have like adrenal cancer or something, uh, that's going to be your change point. And you're going to yeah. look back and you're going to reflect and you are going to hopefully 
and be able to put your ego aside and yeah. ask for the help and support that you need. And you're going to have to hold yourself with compassion and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. But the beginning of that road certainly starts with like putting your hands out and saying, listen, I can't do this on my own. I need, I need some support. I need some help here. And I think that there's an interesting time in our like adulthood, like kind of like from, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 to, I don't know, sometimes now it seems like it's getting later and later, especially with men um like into their like late 30s when they just try and take the world on on their own and they take too much on and asking for help is like you know not okay but without question like asking for help or like saying oh i don't know the answer to this like you know like i i, I love not knowing stuff i love um asking people like what these things are even when people like um assume i should know it uh you know it, it's it's quite liberate it's quite it's very very liberating to be able to say oh i didn't i didn't know that that's interesting that's made me thought about thing in a different completely different way just that approach of like knowing that i don't know everything and like just listening more it's completely revolutionized my life and my mind and my ability to communicate with people because you know usually most people want to um can't wait for their part of the conversation to ramp up again where they can just start talking <laughs> rather than like being able to like be open to, to listening open to your your thoughts and beliefs and you know whatever being being challenged or like maybe changing and um just one more thing because i want to talk about mindfulness because it's obviously a huge part of the work but like just when you were i think that we do a huge disservice to our children and then our adults in regards to not teaching them about like how our brain works and like what we do know anyway in regards to what the physiology the nervous system and how you know if a child does have a parent with a mental health disorder and they are experiencing uh certain types of like negative emotions or trauma like con consistent on a consistent basis that will end up becoming their reality because this is like a neuro these are neuro pathways that like fire and wire together and unless something changes and a, a new input is you know repeated and trained you will inevitably grow into an adult with that same pathway to guilt or to fear or to anger or to rage like that will literally be set in physical matter not like airy fairy stuff it's literally physically there and unless you want to become less judgmental or less fearful or less angry you have to do the work and literally train like you would muscles in the gym to change them mm -hmm. you actually have to do that work but we do just do this huge disservice and not teaching kids about that in schools and know that they actually have the ability to change things about them that they might not like and that might not serve them so i think that's a huge important piece as well but like you know you're, you're an educator you're out there you're doing that as well but you know it's a shame that we have to do this to like 30 year old 40 year old adults rather than them knowing it themselves and giving them the, the compassion to recognize that okay maybe i am like this because of that but you know maybe i can maybe i can totally change that I totally agree with you. And I'm also a mindfulness practitioner and I do a mindfulness group every two weeks. And it is about teaching the group participants to be more mindful in their daily life and to break this cycle of, of stress of, as you said before, running like a machine that has to work constantly, nonstop, without taking any break, without any fault, without breaking down. And <laughs> this sounds is like what my coffee, sounds, like my, sounds like my coffee machine. <laughs> exactly. But this is what people are nowadays. They have to work like this and they yeah. believe they need to. So the idea of mindfulness is actually not just to bring people in the present moment, but how to bring them in the present moment. And the idea is not just to do some meditation, it is even to take one or two or three minutes out in between just to do some breathing exercises to listen to the breath or even just when you are walking to the office to look at your surroundings, to see the trees, to see the flowers, to slow down a bit because this can break the cycle of your neurons. It mm -hmm. can break the cycle of stress and it gives you a different perspective. And like when I did my last mindfulness class, for example, I did. Apart from the mindfulness, always I do a special meditation, mindfulness meditation with the participants. And last time I did a, it's called loving kindness meditation of the body. So you start to accept yourself again as you are with your good parts, your bad parts. Maybe you have a problem in your feet or in your knees. I was interesting. After we did all of that, one of the participants, also a man, said, 
you know, it's the first time in 35 years that I could hear my heartbeat. No. Oh. Get the point. I mean, we are so focused in working like a machine that we are not even listening to our heartbeat. We are not listening to our breath. We are not listening to ourselves. And that's the idea where mindfulness comes in to break this patterns of stress of of all this which comes as external influences that we start again listening and hearing our thoughts our mind our body that we feel these feelings the sensations the emotions that we have in a non-judgmental way just to know they are here and to have this curiosity, what is going on inside us? Why do we react now in this very moment as we do? And to slow down, to take a break, to take a step back and really to, to listen what is going on inside us. And this helps to create a healthier mind because once we are able to listen to what our thoughts are, to, to feel our emotions, our sensations, we are more in tune with ourselves and we start again to reconnect with our internal self, with our inner core self. And I think this is essential also to create healthy minds and to, to become stronger. And I mean, even it is scientifically proven, for example, that you improve your cognitive function, you reduce your blood pressure, <laughs> you reduce stress, you improve your immune system when you do mindfulness or mindfulness meditations. So it has a positive impact and it is amazing to see how disconnected people are and how much they experience, even when we do this one hour class, how much they can experience suddenly their feelings, their sensations and their in, inner being. And uh, it's fascinating to see. And uh, if we would do this more, even during our normal working time, even two, three minutes while we go for a lunch break, uh, just to do a few breathing exercises, we will feel much better, we reduce stress, and we calm down again, and we calm our mind, we relax our mind. Beautiful. Yeah, I think so much of what we think, uh, feel, and do is completely subconscious, and our body is literally like taking our mind day to day, controlling it, kind of like 95% 95, 95 of it goes just past our awareness and we just do these things because we're constantly like looking forward to you know the what we're going to do in like our day and like we're worrying about this and worrying about that and it's just absolutely impossible to even think about like the present moment or even looking at back at the past to you know try and re to resolve things it's impossible to do that when we're constantly thinking about and stressed about the future and like what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and when our mind is completely unconscious, you know, like, and yeah, like I remember reading some interesting statistics about like 95% of what we think, feel and do is just like, you know, it's, just, it's a subconscious program that's just running completely without our awareness. And then when we do introduce some like absolutely ancient practices of mindfulness and meditation and like yoga and all these things and you can just look at how difficult it is for most people to sit still for five minutes you know with their with their awareness on like maybe their third eye or they put their awareness like yeah. or they scan their body and do stuff you know like so so difficult for people in regards to do that and very uncomfortable for them because their body is so used to carrying them through the world that having to sit down and control their physical bodies like the mind is beginning to take over a little bit and like controlling the body to say sit down stay relax stay present and then your mind drifts off to the other things that you should be doing and then you have to like bring it back to the like present moment and it takes so much practice because we have practiced ourselves out of doing that and as you say like you do these incredible like mindfulness practices and you know i have a lot of experience with it myself and it's revol revolutionized the way that i walk through my day to day yeah. um you just see things you just see things different you see the colors of the leaves you know you, you you're able to take a minute and appreciate so much other things and then you're experiencing more you know positive positive emotions day to day rather than just like just missing the beauty of life and yeah it can be quite quite astounding in regards to what it can do for your physical health your mental health and your ability to you know heal those past things that are energetically um keeping you keeping you stuck in the past and certainly as far away from the present moment as possible 
Absolutely. And you, you know, when I started with mindfulness, actually, I realized how beautiful are our surroundings. If you see a, a little bird somewhere singing in the trees, you start realizing it consciously. And it removes everything from your mind. You just focus on it and you start again to appreciate and to become more grateful. And once you do this, you feel personally so much better, so much more joyful, so much happier uh, that it really creates a change. And it, this kind of joy and this kind of happiness is nothing that money can buy. It is something that is around you, that you have accessible each single moment of your day. Just you need to become aware of it. You need to become to, to open yourself to see it and to accept it and to let it come in. And then it is changing the way how you go through your day. It, it makes everything so much better. And it puts things into relation. Even if you have a stressful day or you have a lot of trouble or you uh, have a fight with somebody. But then when you see this, it brings it into perspective. And I think that's so much needed nowadays in our stressful lives. And it is changing the way how we live and it is changing the way how we experience things, how we experience the beauty around us. And it's accessible like at any point in time. You can stop and take breath. You can stop and meditate literally at any time. It's free to do yeah. it. You might need to practice a little bit with, with a practitioner or a program or an app or something, but you've got the power to literally control your nervous system and your conscious mind with 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 breath it's so simple and so easy and maybe that's a difficult thing for people to maybe like understand but you know yeah until people kind of really like hit that like climax of of struggle that their physical and mental body just like can't deal with it anymore usually when people start to become a little bit more aware of like yeah. how they're thinking how they're feeling and how they're behaving and how that's kind of like holding them back from feeling awesome because we all deserve to do that and uh yeah that's interesting well how can people connect with you I'd i could talk to you all day about all these different types of topics and i've got so many questions that i missed today but maybe we can get you back on the show but how can people connect with you well they can, can connect with me through my website uh, www.coachformentalhealth.com so they can send me an email info at coach uh, for mental they can also connect through my instagram and facebook um, or through linkedin and i'm always happy to help and to answer questions or to, to give a guiding hand because uh, i think it is really needed nowadays and uh, <laughs> It's not just, as we said, it, some people, they really hit the point, they, they really hit rock bottom where they know they need to change something. And uh, that's why yeah, you have people like me <laughs> as mental health coaches to do that. But they can reach out to me, as I said, through my website, through my email and through my social media. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think it's so important I, with it, a big part of this podcast is I want to create some education, some motivation, some inspiration for people to take those steps before they hit that like rock bottom you know and because that can be a challenging place to come back from it's also you know potentially a place of enlightenment and and change to step into the unfamiliar but um you know there are there, there are certainly we don't there are certainly people out there that experience their trauma their pain and their stress for decades before yeah. before that moment so hopefully we can inspire people to maybe take that step a little bit earlier because you know life's beautiful it's fragile it's short and we should, you know, try and spend it, spend it within as much uh, joy and happiness as possible. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so glad that you exist and that your job exists and you're out there doing this wonderful, wonderful thing. Like you are serving the world so, so well. And I appreciate that energy that you put out into it. Thank you so much. And if somebody would like, for example, to join the mindfulness sessions that I do, they are for free every two weeks on Mondays. So they can also do that. They can join in through the website, join the group. And uh, it is an offer, as you say, for somebody who, who might really need some help. And uh, I'm always happy to help because I think it's really needed. And uh, to see the change, it's the most beautiful reward for me when I really see how I can change lives of people. That's magical. Thank you so much. I will make sure that in the show notes for the uh, for this for this episode that we'll have connections to your website, and I'll try to find a link to that mindfulness page as well, and um, so people can check that out if they want to. But thank you so much again. Thank you so much. It was lovely to be on the show, and good luck for your podcast. And it's so valuable for everybody out there. Thank you so much.
Beautiful. Thank you. Well, that is it for this episode of the True Hope Podcast, the official podcast of True Hope Canada. Don't forget to check the show notes to connect with Dr. Margaret. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. You can leave us a review on iTunes if you wish. But that is it for this week. We'll see you soon.